Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a thrill for me to be here. I feel um, really humbled to share this stage. And, and honestly, I, I feel like I'm here from, from, another, from another planet or something, certainly from another country. And, and I guess, in a sense, I am. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I am honored to be able to tell my story, to share my story, to give you a glimpse, just a small glimpse, of some of the global developments happening in liberal education. For the past 17 years, I've lived in Europe. <clears throat> For my first <laughs> 17 years, I lived in the town of Stockton, a farming community on the outskirts of Stevens Point, just an hour west of here. At both of these 17-year milestones, my world has been lifted by liberal arts. At 17, I chose Lawrence, over a school of engineering. I thought that I wanted to be a biomechanical engineer to design high-tech prosthetic limbs. But a wise high school guidance counselor, I don't know if they still exist, <laughs> as well as an aggressive Lawrence admissions office convinced me otherwise. They made me realize that I could always do that. But first, get an education. So at 17, I chose Lawrence, and, and I'm so glad I did. I chose it in part because of the possibility of a 3-2 engineering program, although in the end I never made use of that. Instead, I majored in chemistry, and along the way I studied art and philosophy and jazz history and, and physics, where I managed to snag a coveted summer research spot in the laser laboratory of Professor Brandenburger. I'm not going to tell you about spectroscopy, <laughs> but let me tell you that that summer inspired and propelled a career in science. A career that took me to Caltech for a PhD, followed by what was supposed to be a one-year postdoc in Sweden, and instead I opted to make Europe my home and build a career in research and academia abroad. <clears throat> Now, 17 years on, I'm thrilled to have the chance to come back to liberal education by playing a role in bringing it to the Netherlands, by bringing it, ironically, to a school of engineering. The Netherlands is a small country, a small country that thinks big. It's prided for its innovative and entrepreneurial spirit. The Dutch educational system is quite different from what you know here. At the age of 12, students are sorted into educational streams according to their intellectual capacity and potential. Those who graduate from the most rigorous of these um, tracks, they earn their entrance to university. In fact, to any university of their choosing. That's right. There's no complicated admissions process. The selection is done by the students and not by the universities except in the case of the most popular programs where there's a so-called numerous fixes. And in those cases, there's a, a weighted lottery system that determines the admission. There are 13 universities in the Netherlands. And of these, uh, three of them focus on technology, including my own, the University of Twente, located in Enschede. For the past six years, I've been a professor of physics there. All of the Dutch universities are public institutions. All of them are tuition free, and all of them are, are world class, 12 of the 13 making it into the top 200 of the, of the latest world rankings. Nonetheless, in spite of this, um, all of them are currently undergoing sig significant educational reforms. The changes in higher education in the Netherlands are driven by a number of factors, most notably the Bologna process, which was started in 1999 and now connects 46 countries by a common degree structure that allows for greater mobility across Europe. In the Netherlands, the bachelor's degree is a specialized three-year study. The applied physics program in which I teach contains nothing but physics and math and physics courses. <laughs> well, students do complete a minor, but then again, a minor in more physics is also allowed. So the concept of introducing a broad bachelor's education requires a lot of explaining <laughs> to students, to their parents, and, and also to their future employers. 
However, a, a graduate of a Dutch bachelor's program is very unlikely to seek a job directly. Nearly all of them stream into master's programs that offer an, a higher level of specialization. So hence, in the sciences, it's now a three plus two program that is specialized and more specialized for almost all university students that ultimately cul culminates in a master's degree. Besides these structural changes, which were imposed by Bologna, however, there, there's another compelling factor that's driving educational reform now in the Netherlands, one that's driven more by the culture, and that is a call for excellence. Now, the Netherlands has long been a very egalitarian society, where success means fitting in and not standing out. As such, there have been plenty of initiatives to bring up the students at the bottom, but there are few to encourage any extraordinary talents at the top. Until now, now excellence is on the agenda and excellent students are really center stage. One of the most prominent and positive initiatives for excellent students in the last decade has been the introduction of the so-called university colleges. Since the first was established in Utrecht in 1999, we now have six. Each of them are affiliated with one of the 13 universities. These university colleges are modeled after premier American liberal arts institutions, much like Lawrence, and they offer something new in the Dutch educational landscape, a broad bachelor's program in English, thus international as well, in a residential setting for selected students, top students. It's not for everyone. And there are still top students who choose for a, um, a, a specialized program. But this new type of education is really attracting a new type of student, or at least a type of student that's long been overlooked in the more one-size-fits-all Dutch curriculum. These are students for which the academic study is simply too narrow. These are students who don't these are, these, are not, these are not students who don't know which study to choose. No, these are students who choose not to choose, but instead choose to develop themselves broadly, or at least to delay specialization until the master's phase. I think that this is really an important aspect in why liberal education has such great potential in the Netherlands. Because um, <clears throat> for almost all students, it's automatically a three plus two program, offering them the best of both worlds, the possibility for a broad education, as well as that specialization which opens the door to employability. Of course, a lack of depth on starting a master's uh, is, is inevitable, but the added value of a liberal education will compensate. I know this myself, from my own experience, that it wasn't in spite of, but rather in recognition of, my liberal education that I was admitted to every prestigious graduate program to which I applied. And I'm reminded of this every summer by the stream of third year liberal arts students who come to my research group via the LUR1 program and, and who shine. So my own experience with this educational model with a broad foundation in liberal arts and a deep specialization um, following is helping now to shape what will soon become the seventh university college in the Netherlands at the University of Twente. This one is unique in that it's the first aimed specifically at students who excel in math and science, who want a broad education built around challenging problems of society, which require both technological as well as social perspectives. The motto of our university is high tech, human touch reflecting the two pillars that comprise our research and educational offerings, technology and social sciences. And these two are merged in our new university college called ATLAS, the Academy of Liberal Arts, uh, the Academy of Technology and Liberal Arts and Sciences. This is currently being designed by some of the top teachers of our university, half coming from the technology side, half coming from the social sciences, and where mixed pairs are now responsible for every aspect of the curriculum development to try and ensure enough breadth in the program. 
Our educational concept involves a common framework for a mixed student body whose interests span from the technological to the social sciences. While knowledge and information will come from various sources, perhaps including MOOCs, the real learning is experiential. We will use project-led education where challenging real-world problems requiring students to dig deep to understand the fundamentals, but also to reach wide to apply multidisciplinary perspectives, will stimulate teams of students to work together for creative solutions. About 50% of the students' efforts will be based in these projects, and the remainder is then filled with further deepening of theory and training relevant skills and passion. So while our educational approach is based on teamwork and projects, the program also is really focused on personal development and on individual learning outcomes. And one of the more unique aspects in our program is called the personal pursuit, which is modeled after a similar element in the curriculum of Olin College, where each student has the opportunity to pursue a passion, be it sports, or music, or theater, or quantum entanglement. <laughs> Perhaps something that began as a boyhood hobby in, in model railroading, for example, could spawn a passion for control engineering or urban planning. By personalizing the program for each student in this way, by identifying, encouraging, and supporting their passions, by providing a competent mentor or coach, and by linking it to the student's individual learning outcomes, we hope to instill the value of, of lifelong learning that goes beyond the classroom, and maybe even create lifelong mentors and friends who continue to inspire the students and even her children. So we're excited to be launching Atlas this fall. Ultimately, our aim is to produce broadly educated, flexible thinkers and doers, <clears throat> lifelong learners who are able to work in teams and to cope with the shifting perspectives coming from cultural or political contexts, new engineers who possess the skills and the resources to solve not only today's problems, but tomorrow's problems and the day after tomorrow's problems. Looking back, when I was 17, I thought I wanted to be a biomechanical engineer designing high-tech robotic prosthetics. I didn't choose that path, but it's still a very noble aim, I think, for 17-year-olds, especially, I would argue, when pursued in the context of social, economic, psychological, and, and cultural issues. Technology and liberal education go hand in hand. And together, I think, can lift the world. Thank you.